King Aegon's enemies were on the march. Down the neck came Cregan Stark, the Lord of Winterfell, with a great host at his back. Septon Eustace speaks of 20,000 howling savages in shaggy pelts. The Munkin lowers that to 8,000 in his true telling. Even as the Maiden of the Vell sent off her own armies from Goldtown, 10,000 under the command of Lewin Corbray and his brother Sir Corwin, who brought the famous Valyrian blade called Lady Forlorn. The most immediate threat, however, was that posed by the men of the Trident. Near 6,000 of them had gathered at River Run, where Elmo Tully called his banners. Sadly, the Lord Elmo himself had expired on the march after drinking some bad water after only 94 days as Lord of River Run. So the Lordship had passed to his eldest son, Sir Kermit Tully, a wild, headstrong youth eager to prove himself as a warrior. There were six days' march from King's Landing, moving down the King's Road, when Lord Boris Baratheon led his Stormlanders forth to meet them. His strength, bolstered by levies from Stokeworth, Rosby, Hayford and Duskendale, along with 2,000 men and boys from the streets of Fleabottom, hastily armed with spears and iron pot helms. The opposing armies came together two days from the city, at a place where the King's Road passed between a wood and a low hill. It had been raining heavily for days, and the grass was wet, the ground soft and muddy. Lord Boris was confident of his victory, as his scouts had told him that the rivermen were led by boys and women. It was nigh unto dusk when he spied the enemy, yet he ordered an immediate attack. Though the road ahead was a solid wall of shields, and the hill to its right bristled with archers, Lord Boris led the charge himself, forming his knights into a wedge as he thundered down the road at the heart of the foe, where the silver trout of River Run floated in its blue and red banner beside the quartered arms of the dead Queen Rhaenyra. The foot soldiers advanced behind them, beneath King Aegon's golden dragon. The citadel names the clash that followed the Battle of the King's Road. The men who fought in it named it the Muddy Mess. By any name, it is the last true battle of the Dance of the Dragons and would prove to be a one-sided affair. The longbows on the hill shot the horses out from under Lord Boris's knights as they charged, bringing down so many that less than half of his riders ever reached the shield wall. Those that did found their ranks disordered, their wedge broken, their horses slipping and struggling in the soft mud. Though the Stormlanders did wreak great havoc with their lances, swords and long axes, the river lords held firm as new men stepped in to fill the places of those who fell. When Lord Baratheon's foot soldiers came crashing into the fray as well, the shield wall swayed and staggered back, and it seemed as if for a moment it might break, till the forest to the left of the road erupted with shouts and screams, and hundreds more rivermen burst from the trees, led by the mad boy Benjicott Blackwood, who would this day earn the name Bloody Ben by which he would be known for the rest of his long life. Lord Boris himself was still a horse, in the middle of all the carnage. When he saw that the battle was slipping away, his lordship bade that his squire sound his war horn, signalling his reserves to advance. But upon hearing the horn, however, the men of Rosby, Stokeworth and Hayford let fall the king's golden dragon and remained unmoving. The rabble of peasants from King's Landing scattered like geese, and the knights of Duskendale went over to the foe, attacking the Stormlanders in the rear. Battle turned into rout in half a heartbeat, as King Aegon's last army was left shattered. Boris Baratheon perished fighting, unhorsed when his mount was felled by arrows and Black Alley and her bowmen. He battled on foot, cutting down countless men-at-arms, a dozen knights, and Lord Malister and Lord Darry. By the time Kermit Tully came upon him, Lord Boris was dead upon his feet bareheaded as he had ripped off his dented helm, bleeding a score of wounds, scarce able to stand. Yield, sir, called the Lord of Riverrun to the Lord of Storm's End. The day is ours, but Lord Baratheon answered with a curse, saying, I'd sooner dance in hell than wear your chains. Then he charged straight into the spiked iron ball at the end of Lord Kermit's morning star, which took him full in the face in a grisly spray of blood and bone and brain. The Lord of Storm's End died in the mud along the King's Road, his sword still in his hand. When ravens brought word of the battle back to the Red Keep, the Green Council hurriedly convened, 
all of the sea snake Corlys Valarian's warnings had proven to be true. Castle Rock, High Garden, and Old Town had been slow to reply to the king's demand for more armies. When they did, they offered excuses and provocations in place of promises. The Lannisters were emboldened in their war with the Red Kraken from the Iron Islands. The High Towers had lost too many men and had no capable commanders left. The young Lord Tyrell's mother wrote to say that she had reason to doubt the loyalty of her son's bannerman, being a mere woman, that she was not fit to lead the host to war. Sir Tyler Lannister, Sir Marsden Waters, Sir Julian Wormwood, had been dispatched across the narrow sea to seek after Selsots in Pentos Tyros and Mere, but none had yet returned. King Aegon II would soon stand naked before his enemies. All of the king's men knew so. Bloody Ben Blackwood, Kermit Tully, up of a three, and their brothers in victory were preparing to resume their swift advance upon King's Landing, and only a few days behind them, Lord Cregan Stark and his Northmen, the Bravosi fleet carrying the Arryn host had also departed Goldtown, and was sailing towards the gullet, where only young Alan Valerian stood in their way, and the loyalty of Driftmark could not be relied upon. <laughs>